And welcome, everyone. Tonight we're talking about sanctification. Sanctification. And what that means is holiness. Sanctification is really a technical word that means holiness. And holiness means to set apart, to separate, to disconnect, really. And it's mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible, sanctification or holiness. So, you see, as it shows us here, Psalm 4, verse 3, it says, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Holiness is the act of God by which he cleanses and separates believers from sin to himself. So it means to set apart from sin and to make holy, not only in position, but in practice. So we're going to look through some of those truths tonight, uh, God helping us. So the word holy is hagios in the Greek, which basically means different. And it's interesting it's got two components, ha, gios. So ha means not, and gios means, as in geography, the world or the earth. So not of the earth or not of the world, literally not earthly. And so we know the Bible tells us that we don't belong to the world. We're not of the world. We don't belong to this world, this cosmos anymore. Our allegiance, our government is to the kingdom of God, our king, the Lord. So just an interesting thought to capture that idea as we go along, not of the earth, not of the world. Holiness, sanctification, it means to separate from defilement or to purify. So you've got some different scriptures there, as we've got there, Titus 2. He wants to purify unto himself a peculiar people. To separate from defilement, to purify, to dedicate is another meaning, as it tells us that we should come out from among them and be separate. To consecrate, Romans 12, 1, a familiar one, that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, which consecrate ourselves to him. And holiness, sanctification has got this connection too with service. So we are called a holy priesthood. In the Bible, people and things were classed as holy. In other words, separated from the common, different. And holiness is not about religious observance or rules, or morality or externalism, really. It's not self-righteousness or isolationism or something that's performance-based. Truly, sanctification, holiness, it's the work of God. It comes from God. And really and truly, our holiness is Christ himself. It tells us here that we're partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1 verse 4. It's like God's nature is holy. Sanctification is that relationship with God by which men enter by faith in Christ and to which their sole title is the death of Christ, that Christ died for our sins, Christ died to make us holy. It's God's will for every believer to be holy, that we are sanctified, made holy. As you see there in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 4, it says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So God wants us to be sanctified, to be made holy, and this process of becoming holy and pure is God's will for us. And it tells us in the word that our old nature is crucified and our new nature is strengthened. Galatians 2 verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So it's Christ's life in us. It's God's will that we be sanctified. So we're going to learn about what that's all about as we go through. And sanctification is a twofold thing. It's both a separation from evil and a separation unto God. Many scriptures talk about cleansing, about sanctifying, about carrying forth, as this example here, carrying forth filthiness, bringing out the uncleanness, cleansing. So there's a separation from evil and then there's a separation unto, unto God. So we should sanctify unto the Lord, as in uh, when we serve him or whatever we do, we can serve God because we're sanctified. And really holiness is a positive thing as much as there's a negative aspect Really, it's a positive thing that's unto God, unto the Lord. And so as a believer, we want to please our God. We want to depart from sin. We want to die to self and to sin. We want to walk in newness of life because of our love for our Lord. We want to become more like him and less like the world. So unearthly, not of the earth. And through the Bible, it talks about sanctification of many different kinds of things. 
For example, certain places, the tabernacle, the temple, a house, a field, a mountain, it's called holy, sanctified. Certain places, certain things as well, the furniture and vessels of the tabernacle, days and seasons are called holy. Even food uh, is sanctified. So things. And then people. Israel's firstborn. Priests are sanctified. Jeremiah, Paul. Believers. Even our Lord is sanctified. Made holy. So of course tonight we're really just focusing on people as in how do we get holy? It's about the people of God. Sanctification for the people of God. And here's a quote in your notes. It says, Sanctification is the operation of God the Father whereby he makes the believer like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And sanctification is a new creation, a new man, a new heart, a new spirit, the conformity of man to the image of the Son of God. Sanctification. So we're going to look particularly at the sanctification of the believer tonight. And when does it happen? What's the timing, the time of sanctification? It's actually, as we see here in Hebrews 10 verse 10, that it's instantaneous. It tells that through the offering of Christ once for all, we're sanctified. It says, 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says of Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification, that word, and redemption. So it's instantaneous. When we receive Christ, we receive sanctification at the point of conversion. And we're made a saint, which means a holy one, a sanctified one. And this is used of every Christian. Every believer is a saint. And saints are mentioned over 100 times. So as God's people, we're all called saints. So sanctified ones, holy ones. The time of sanctification is at conversion, as we see those different scriptures there. And the source of sanctification is, as we said before, it's from God. It's the work of God. And the whole Godhead is really that source of sanctification. He does not expect us to achieve sanctification of ourselves. God sanctifies us. And it's the power that worked for us at the cross and the resurrection, the power that is at work in us uh, through our Christian walk. The presence of God affects holiness. So we see those different scriptures there. It tells us that it's the power that worketh in us. Ephesians 3.20 talks about strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. It tells us be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So it's God's doing, it's God's grace that helps us. And we see all of those aspects of God at work in us. It's God that strengthens us and helps us to be righteous. And it's the work of the three persons of the Trinity. We see God the Father. It tells that we're sanctified by God the Father in Jude 1 verse 1 there. And he preserves the believer blameless unto the coming of our Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24. It tells us that God the Son, the Lord Jesus, sanctifies believers and through his death. And he is our sanctification, as we read before. Christ is made unto us our sanctification. It says we're sanctified once and for all by one offering, perfected forever. It tells of his church that he might sanctify and cleanse it through the washing of water by the word. So holiness comes to us through Christ. It's made possible through him. It's God's gift to us. Here's a quote. Holiness is not the way to Christ, but Christ is the way to holiness. Some people think they've got to become holy in order to be saved, but no, the holiness comes after we get saved. Holiness is not the way to Christ, but Christ is the way to holiness. And all holiness really comes from him. And then we said God, God, the Holy Spirit, makes us holy too. He's the resident, indwelling agent of sanctification. He's resident in us. He should be president in us. The Holy Spirit is the agent that makes us holy. And he affects holiness in his people. It tells us here that we're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It tells us there, 1 Peter 1, 2, talks of through sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know at conversion... We made his living temple. He dwells within us by his spirit. Next section, the means of sanctification. We see these various means here. Faith, the Holy Spirit, the word and grace. So we're sanctified by faith. As we trust in the work of Jesus, our Lord, in dying on the cross for our sin, the blood of Christ makes us holy. 
and it's affected the same way redemption, justification and regeneration is through the sacrifice of Christ. And the saved man, by faith in Christ, through union with Christ, has died to the old life and the fetters of sin are broken. By faith in Christ, he is dead to sin and alive to righteousness. And because of the finished work of Christ, we have that wonderful blessing of sanctification by faith as we trust, as we believe his work at the cross. Then we see it's by the Holy Spirit. We're sanctified by the Holy Ghost. As that Spirit comes and dwells within us at salvation, he affects that deliverance from sin, enables us to serve God. The Holy Spirit continues to work in us as he convicts us, empowers us, draws us to Christ, transforms us into greater conformity to Christ. The third one there, we see the word of God. The Lord Jesus prayed for his church. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we know the word of God tells us that we're born again. And we're begotten again by the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23, we're sanctified by the word. As the psalmist cried, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. Psalm 119, 9. Of course, the word of God shows us what sin is. Uh, apparently there's 103 different sins listed in the New Testament. It shows us what sin is, it reveals it. And it's compared to like a mirror in James 1, where we look in the Word and it's like a looking into a mirror. We can see our defects and we can see how we need to wash the dirt away. And the Bible talks about a renewing of our mind. It says we align ourselves with God's truth, His Word. And then we see really that sanctification... Sanctification is by the grace of God. As it says in John 15, 5, our Lord says, without me, you can do nothing. We need the grace of God. And man can only use the grace provisions placed at his disposal, which he's encouraged to do. So it talks about cleansing ourselves, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Here's another quote. Holiness is not an achievement to be accomplished, but a gift to be accepted. There's a wonderful truth that sanctification is it's God's grace he helps us he affects it yet we are called to action too we see in the next section here some of the things that God calls us to exercise to make that holiness effectual we see that we should exercise faith as we trust in the fact that Christ has made unto us our sanctification we should study the word of God uh, that has that cleansing that washing of water by the word we should pray. It talks about things being sanctified, made holy by the word of God and prayer. We should fellowship, have fellowship one with another. And we should yield to God as these vessels unto honour, sanctified, made holy, made meat, prepared for the master to use. So all of those things are more like practical things we can also put into action in our lives. So there's somewhat of a complexity in that there's really three different aspects to do with sanctification, a threefold aspect. As you see pictured here in this table and in your notes there, we see you've got past, you've got present, and you've got future. So the past is the positional standing that we have. Really, that's at, that's at salvation. That's instantaneous. That in the past, we have that standing, we're saved, and we're sanctified. As saints, every believer is called a saint. And that is the fact that we're saved. We're, in the past, we've got that positional standing. Then in the present time, there's a progressive element in that God's working that sanctification in our practical living, in that experiential state. And then ultimately in the future, we see the complete state of when we get to glory. We see, as you can see, those different scriptures there. So in the past, some of you were... In sin, it talks about in the context, and it says, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified. So present tense, you're sanctified in the past. Then in the present, we've got the experiential, the progressive thing uh, that he's called us to be holy, so be ye holy. There's a, a need to exercise and to implement that holiness in the day by day, living it out in the progressive, ideally growing in holiness. And then the last one there, you see 1 John 3, 2, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In the ultimate 
glorified state, when we get our new body and we're in heaven, that our holiness will be perfected then. There'll be absolutely no sin and we'll be in that perfect state. So again, that this uh, table, we put it differently here in that in the past, we're delivered from the penalty of sin. So that's our position. We're saved, we're sanctified, delivered from the penalty of sin. There's no more punishment or penalty for our sin because Christ has paid for it at the cross in the past. Then in the present, the progressive, he's delivered us from the power of sin. So in the sense that we're being changed from glory to glory, he's working in us. We're growing in holiness in exercising it practically. And then we're going to ultimately be delivered from the presence of sin. There'll be no more sin in heaven, as we see at the coming of our Lord. So you can see in the notes there, a bit more uh, description of all that. So it's like there's a kind of sequence, you know, there's the sanctification in the salvation context, and then we see uh, that's, that's positional, and then we see more the practical, the more the progressive is living it out, and then ultimately glory, heaven. And the scriptures tell us about this truth called positional sanctification, like we've talked about, it's just really kind of restating it here, that it's instantaneous. It's done once and for all. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So it's instantaneous, absolute, done once and for all, for all eternity. When we've trusted Christ, we've realized that positional sanctification. It's who I am in Christ. It says, Colossians 3, ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. It says 2 Corinthians 5, he hath made him to be sin for us and you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that's our position. We're called saints. We're called sanctified. And Christ is the believer's sanctification. As certainly as salvation is our full and free possession, so too sanctification. We have it as saved people in the present tense. So if we are saved, we are sanctified. We stand before God and Christ's righteousness is affected. Now, there's different teachings that different ones have had over the time. We're not going to labour those different teachings unduly. I'm just trying to give you what I see as the scriptural elements, but there's some that teach a second work of grace or a second blessing. But really, it's not, it's not really so. When we're saved, we are sanctified. We have that sanctification. We are entirely sanctified when we are saved, when we're born again, at that positional level. The, the other aspect is more the progressive as we get to the next section here. So we see that it's who, who we are in Christ. We have his righteousness and, and he has been made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that's the positional sanctification. And as part of that, we see that there's a security that we have. We've got a wonderful security in Christ as well. It tells us there that Believers are called saints irrespective of their spiritual attainments. So it's not about our works. The Corinthians were called sanctified. They were called saints, even though the Corinthians were quite carnal and worldly at times. So it's not dependent on our works, that positional sanctification that we have. Moving on, we'll talk about progressive sanctification here. And again, the progressive sanctification is not to be confused with the positional sanctification. So as saved people, we have sanctification. We've got that position of being sanctified. The progressive is more talking more about the maturity or the growing. It's about Christian growth, effectively. So we see 2 Peter 3, where we're told uh, by Peter, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Romans 6 it tells us to yield your members, servants to righteousness and holiness. There's an exhortation there to put it into action. And then Paul to Timothy says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, as in uh, sin, uh, cleanse yourself, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So there's kind of these two different aspects. As saved people, we're sanctified. But then in the reality, when the rubber hits the road, in the real practicalities of life, there's a call really for us to walk holy. It's more of our, more the onus is on us to put it into action, into practice. And uh, God wants us to walk holy and to live holy. 
Progressive sanctification is more about the Christian growth and, and how he wants us to be more living to his glory. And it's a reality that day by day we can be transformed. As it talks about, as we mentioned, we're transformed, we're changed into the same image from glory to glory. We're made more like Christ. God helping us as a growing Christian will we'll be more evidently walking righteously and living right and we'll separate from the ungodly and so there's practical things we can do to separate from ungodly things, false teachers and doctrines, and address our own sinful nature to, to walk more closely with God. And the believer sets himself apart to God. 1 Peter 3 exhorts us, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. So there's a call there to, to application on our part. As in the notes, it talks about the quote there, holiness is a conformity of the heart and the life unto God. So different, different authors or Bible teachers have described it differently, like the sanctified life as the exchanged life, Hudson Taylor says, the abiding life, in other words, abiding in Christ, and also the crucified life. So it's different aspects of practical living for Christ there. So from the moment of the new birth, we are Christians in the fullest sense. We're complete in Christ. But there is that practicality of life that... We should be growing. We should be exercising our faith. And some of the practical things we can do, as it talks here in this paragraph, as we sanctify the Lord in our hearts, the Holy Spirit will put to death the deeds of the body. The Holy Spirit will work in the believer to obey the word. The Holy Spirit will produce the fruit of the Spirit. So while we are completely sanctified forever, as far as salvation is concerned, there is a continuing need to be progressively sanctified as far as our service. So in other words, our walk, it's our, our serving, our walk with God. And that's where the Holy Spirit enables us to do God's will in all of those different ways and others too. And then we see, again, just to repeat that final stage, the complete and final sanctification is glorification. That's when we get to glory. Either we're raptured or resurrected, we're taken to glory, we come into the Lord's presence and we have the new body. And that's the ultimate and final stage, really, of sanctification. It's glorification, it's called. We get a glorified body. We'll see our Lord face to face. And then our sanctification is complete uh, when we die and go to be with the Lord. And all the presence of sin is removed, and we enter into really sinless perfection. That's when sinless perfection happens, uh, and when we get to glory, when we're glorified. And what joy that will be with uh, no sin, and we'll be entirely conformed to the image of his son. And no matter what progress we may make in a life of holiness, entire conformity to Christ won't be realized till then. We've been saved from the guilt and the penalty of sin at salvation. We are being saved from the power of sin as we walk with God and hopefully grow as a Christian. Ultimately, we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. We'll have complete conformation to the image of Christ, but that's not till glory. For the meantime, we've still got to struggle, uh, in effect, with the practicalities of, of living the life, of walking the walk. But the good news is that we've got Christ as our model. He's the one who helps us. His, his likeness is formed in us, and we're to follow him. We're to know that he is our sanctification. And really, our sanctification is not something we do. It's someone. It's Christ. Christ is our sanctifier. I can't live a holy life. It's quite true to say that, but you can decide to let Jesus make you holy. Now, there's let, let the Lord have his way. It's letting, the more we let the Lord have his way, the more we'll be like him. And that's what holiness is, really. It's Christ's likeness. It's having the mind of Christ. It's appropriating Christ as our sanctification. And the word of God tells us, Jeremiah 23, verse 6, that uh, the Lord Jesus, he is the Lord, our righteousness. It's the fact that Jesus Christ is our righteousness himself. And we appropriate that. His holiness is our holiness. It's not conformity to a code, it's conformity to Christ. It's having Christ as our model. And God helping us will become more and more like him as we go through life. And Paul talks about Christ being formed in us. That's Galatians 4, verse 19. Here's another quote. You have as much holiness as you have of God in you. So the more we let the Lord have his way, 
the more we'll be transformed into his image. And as far as a motive for holiness, our motive for holiness is our love for God. It's not because it's a burdensome, dutiful thing. It's because we love our Lord. And as we grow in his love, we'll appreciate what he has done for us. We'll grow in that motivation to want to please him, to live a life that's holy. There'll be that desire to be that living sacrifice, to be conformed to his image. And we'll be willing to part with sin and uncleanness. When you think that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, think of his love for us. It, it's a motivator, isn't it? When we love God, we'll actively hate evil, we'll obey his word, we'll avoid what displeases him, we'll be dedicated to living, to please him, and it'll be in all manner of conversation. So 1 Peter 1 says, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's the scope. In other words, the behaviour in every department of our lives. That's, that's how big it, he wants it to be, that holiness should be something that is in our thoughts, in our mind, in our actions, in our living. And another thing about holiness is that the call to holiness is a relational thing. It's because we love God. The call to be holy is the call to know him, to love him, to follow him. It's relationship with our Lord, isn't it? That's the fundamental. Really, sanctification, holiness, is not a list of rules. It's a relationship. It's, it's as we come to know him, as we draw closer to him, as we in, improve that relationship, enhance that relationship with our God, as we deepen and strengthen it, that we'll have that more vibrant relationship, he'll help us to live the life that honours him. And as part of this walk that we have, we've got the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, that all three dwell in us, work in us. And as we've seen above, we've seen that he gives direction, help and encouragement, assurance, he helps us to live by faith. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that indwell us as believers. And so we're not alone. We've got his help. We've got divine enablement. And he is going to guide us through our walk with him. Yet there is a battle element to it as well. There's a battle. There's a struggle involved. As unbelievers, we were servants to sin, unwilling and unable to resist sin. But then when we were regenerated, we were freed from the power of sin. We became willing and able to not sin. Why then do we still sin? Of course, there's this reality that the day-by-day day battle goes on because we've got the flesh, we've got the world, the flesh and the devil, and the flesh is still a factor in our lives. We are free from its dominion but not its presence and influence. So there's this daily battle. Paul talks about the struggle inside the good that I would, I don't, the, the, the bad that I shouldn't, I do. You know, this struggle within that he says that it's sin dwelling in me. It's just my flesh there. We see that in Romans 7 as he describes it. It's that inward fight, that contest, that struggle. We know what we ought to do for God, but we don't do it. We know what we ought not to do, and at times we fail. Paul noted this struggle that continued in his life, really one of the most holy men of the word of God. And the battle for holiness is being fought too in the mind. It's like a battle in the mind, the control room, the nerve center, if you like. It's not a sin to have a bad thought, but it is a sin to nurture a bad thought. And we read there 2 Corinthians 10, to bring into captivity every thought, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So for the meantime, there's this battle raging between the flesh and the spirit. And feelings can be and often are self-centered, self-serving, the Bible talks the word lusts or desires. So we've got listed there numbers of lusts, deceitful lusts, foolish and hurtful lusts, youthful lusts, worldly lusts, fleshly lusts, ungodly lusts. And that's the reality of the day by day, this practical, this present time. Sure, we've been made holy. We called holy. We designated as holy as the saints of God. But in the meantime, there's this flesh and spirit battle going on that will go on until our deathbed, we see there's battle raging. And so there's this process where God's continuing his work in the believer. We're declared righteous, we're justified. We've, we're also becoming righteous in our personal conduct, God helping us. It's a process. So we've got this legal status of holiness, and then there's this moral condition that should be brought into conformity. 
this process, this development. And it says we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. So it's a continuous thing. And we're exhorted constantly, obviously, to obedience, to, to, to walk holy, to choose rightly, to walk rightly, to be being filled with the Holy Spirit, that growing, that abounding more and more. That's God's will for us, that we think godly thoughts, you know, think on these things rather than on other things. And so it's this process that we don't instantly become perfect. There's this progressive nature to the walk that we have for all of us. And we're growing in that, God helping us to have more personal righteousness. So we're declared righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. When we're justified, we're saved. But there's this overcoming, this walk, this personal righteousness that is the constant grappling and struggle for the meantime. But in it all, it's a work of grace. It's the grace of God. Many make the mistake of thinking that we are saved by grace, but then we must become holy by our own efforts. You know, there's well-meaning people that think, okay, we're justified by grace, but we've got to keep ourselves or make ourselves holy by our own efforts and strength. But really, we're sanctified by grace too. It's all the grace of God that we're even saved. And, so, and it's all unmerited. We don't deserve it when we get saved. We don't deserve it while he's bearing with us, with our walk when it's faulty. But grace is what meets us in our unworthiness. And grace declares us accepted by God. It meets us in our inadequacy to strengthen us for holy living. So God's grace teaches us, it talks about in Titus 2. It trains us, it teaches us how to live righteously, soberly and godly in this present world. But it's all the grace of God that we can hang on to right through our Christian walk. And this practice of sanctification is some practical things it tells us that we should do is that we should put off sin and put on righteousness. It's like a picture of putting off as in taking a garment off and then putting on being clothed with a garment. So we put off the garment of sin, we put on the garment of righteousness. That's Ephesians 4 talks about that, how we should put off the old man, the fleshly man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you see in the notes there, we won't labour all of that, but that sense of putting off, of realising sin, of dealing with temptation, of asking the Lord to help us to repent, to ask God to help us to overcome, to deal with sin and get victory. The nature of sanctification next, the nature of sanctification, again, I'm just going to repeat some of the things we've probably touched on already, but the fact is sanctification or separation to God is imputed. In other words, it's Christ's righteousness. You know, he has he's made sin for us and you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's imputed. Christ's righteousness is granted. It's a gift. And we're made purified, hopefully in our walk, from moral evil and then conformed ultimately to the image of Christ. So again, some of this is a bit repetitive, but there's that separation that's positional, the, the fact that we're saved. There's that dedication as we're separated unto God, unto his fellowship. We're God's property. There's purification. So God cleanses us. We're sanctified by the blood. And there's consecration, conformity. We're called to be conformed to the divine nature, to follow holiness. And then there's service as well. So when Israel was called holy, the priests were called holy, it was with the intent of service. There's a real aspect of service there. And for us today, we are called the royal priesthood. So we're actually meant to be serving God as worshippers. We're meant to be walking in in that servant, servant capacity to serve God. And we can't really serve God unless we've got that holiness because otherwise it's vain. We see degrees of sanctification there. It's going, uh, repeating really the same thoughts in a diff different way in your notes there. We'll move on to practical suggestions. And this is a helpful little list that might help us, you know, to guide us in that practical aspect of how we live the Christian walk when we're faced with a decision or some challenge as to what to do, whether something's right or wrong or something is sin or not, these questions can help us to determine that. Can I do this in faith?
Can I do this with all my heart? Can I do this as if for the Lord? Is it something that's profitable? Am I bound by it? Does it become a bondage for me? Does it hinder my neighbour? Would I be ashamed to be doing it at his coming? So there's lots of ways practically we could think of the decisions we make, of things that we do or don't do, what actions we take or don't take. Really asking, what would God want? What would the Lord think of that? What would help me to become more like Christ? What would help me to walk righteously? And Holiness has been called the power to overcome temptation. So it's the daily work of the Holy Spirit to clean out and clean up our life so that it honours him. Here's another quote, saying yes to God means saying no to things that offend his holiness. So it's just having that heart. What would the Lord want? What is the best? What is God's best? So next section, how can we live the sanctified life? This picks up from Romans 6 to 8, where it talks about some key things to do. And again, in that struggle with sin that Paul talked about, we should firstly know that the old self was crucified. This is how we can get victory over sin, to know that our old self was crucified with Christ and now we've been raised with him to new life. So henceforth we should not serve sin. That's Romans 6 verse 6. So we can know as believers that our old life, the old man, the old Andrew Craig was destroyed, put to death at Calvary. Colossians 3 says, ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So we can know that we're put to death. We know that we've died. We've crucified the flesh. By faith, we can see that our fallen human fleshliness was dealt with at the cross. Then we can reckon, we can consider ourselves to be dead to sin. Reckon it. I guess determine it. Uh, consider that, that we are dead to sin but alive to Christ. And so we must not yield our body to sin, but rather yield ourselves to God. And that's the, the third aspect there of yielding to God, to let the Lord be the king that rules over us, to let the Lord use us in his service, to yield to God, to surrender. It talks there of yielding your members. And it's got the sense, I understand, of like weapons of war. You're yielding yourself is like weapons of war, as servants to righteousness. It takes a deliberate decision of the will. And then Romans 8 talks about there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So as we appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit, he will help us to walk after the Spirit by his power, under his control. Next one, it talks about sanctification is a living person. Again, sanctification, our holiness is Christ. Our holiness is Christ and our continuing fellowship with him. So we're called to abide in him, his word to abide in us. We're called to press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling. There's a sense where it's Christ, it's Christ in us. It's Christ working in us through his word. It's us walking with him. Another aspect is cleansing. Cleansing is talked about in connection with holiness a lot too. Like the Old Testament priests had to wash themselves before they could be consecrated. The high priest had to wash himself before going into the Holy of Holies. And many New Testament passages talk about cleansing and holiness. They're kind of connected, that we're washed free from sins. Of course, it talks about how we, we're washed by his blood. We've got cleansing by the blood. And God does a purifying work when we're saved. And then we see this, like this ongoing cleansing, of, a cleansing of hands, of heart, of conscience, of mind as well. We're crucified to the world. So that's another thought, just a, another aspect. We talked about the world, the flesh and the devil. And of course we talked about when we started about we're not of the earth, hagios, we're not of the world, we're not worldly. And the world really is a picture of the enemy's territory. Really we're strangers and pilgrims here. We're just passing through, aren't we? We're laying up treasures in heaven and we're to set our affection on things above. And the Bible tells us that we're crucified to the world. And it talks about a number of things here, the things of the world, the world's sin, wisdom, the world's friendship, pollutions, the elements of the world, the contamination, the corruption, the filth, the spirit of the world. We're crucified to the world and the things of the world. So as God helping us as sanctified people, as a people made holy by God, that we should 
want to be unearthly. <laughs> we should want to be unworldly. We shouldn't want to be like the world and the things of the world. And when you think about sanctification, think of the cost of it. It was the blood of Christ that was our Lord uh, and his precious gift, his sacrifice on Calvary. And it's a very valuable thing, our sanctification. And how do we receive it? By faith. We trust that just as we're justified by faith, we're regenerated by faith, we're sanctified by faith. We trust that God is doing that work. God has done that work. God did everything that he had to do to take away our sin at Calvary. And so we've got that wonderful realisation that we have sanctification. And yet there's kind of a, as it talks about here in the section there, the dual responsibility. It's almost like the hymn, Trust and Obey. So we trust that we're saved, we're born again, but allied to that, there's a thought where we should, we should obey, we should, we should walk in obedience. So there's positionally, we trust, we're saved. Obey is more the progressive, it's the practicality of that walk of holiness that he calls us to, to live, that we've got that responsibility to walk with him, God helping us to. So just some practicalities that it talks about here of how we can put it into action, put it into practice, the justified believer is expected to live a holy life. It should be seen in our living. So here's how someone's described it. Obeying the law, the law of love, the law of Christ, the law written in our heart. Uh, we should see that we should be putting off the old man, putting on the new. We should be walking in Christ's lordship, walking in the light, walking in the spirit, walking in love. We should be abiding in Christ, depending on him for power and fruitfulness. We should be putting to death putting off evil, uh, putting on the good and putting on love. We should be doing good in every possible way and living the life of faith. So these are some practical things we can think about. How can I exercise that in my life? How can I practically walk that walk that he wants us to, to walk? Another set of lists here is how sanctification can show itself in our life, in our daily life. We should have a fear of God a love for God, a submission to his will. We should attend to his word. We should want to witness the ministers of reconciliation. We're all called to be ambassadors of Christ. We should want to fellowship with those of like precious faith. We should want to be living and walking in the spirit and seeking for the glory of God in all that we do in the ultimate time that we will see his glory. So there's a decision here that's called for. There's choices we can make. There's ways we can practically determine, how can I walk that walk that I'm called to? And that holiness is not something that you're supposed to achieve on your own. The good news is you're not on your own. We can't make ourselves holy. You know, there's lots of cults out there that try to walk a holy walk or, or live a holy life, but they're not even saved, so they're not even at first base. Uh, but holiness comes from God. He imparts it. He imputes it. Christ is our righteousness. And the good news is that Christ enables us to walk with him. And we see, as it's listed here, holiness, it's a decision of your will. It's what you choose to do. There's daily choices, really hourly choices that we make, isn't that, through life. And it talks about a departing from sin. 2 Timothy 2.19 tells us, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ Depart from iniquity. So choose to depart from iniquity. It's a dying to sin, a dying to self, a walking in newness of life. It's a desire to please God, getting those healthy desires for heavenly things. It's seeking those things, those things which are above, setting your affection on things above, Colossians 3, 1 to 2, not on things on the earth. So our Lord calls us to have this heart to cultivate this holiness through spiritual disciplines. We could think of prayer or fasting, studying the word of fellowship. It's a choice that we make, isn't it? We can think about how can I implement some practical things in my life to be more pleasing to my Lord. Maintaining holiness. We see that God's provided the means. What is our response? Realize our need of it. Know that holiness is God's will. Recognize it as God's work in us. He's going to finish what he started. You know, he's, he's working in us. Um, it talks about he'll perform that which he started, Philippians 2. So know your position in Christ, that you're dead to sin, 
That's what it tells you that you are. So we appropriate holiness by faith. It's his promise that we can have it. We can know it. And we can be more like Christ. We can copy Christ and be like him. Be Christ-like. We can reckon ourselves dead to sin. The desires of the old nature, we can, day by day, God helping us, we can put to death those fleshly desires and crucify them and throw off the old sinful ways of the old life. Now, it's very easy, you know, we can all have things that we used to do as an unsaved person to revert back to them, but we, God helping us, he'll keep us strong and we'll say no to that. And while there's a battle with the indwelling sin, sin is not to have mastery over the Christian. So it's God helping us will exercise practical obedience as we walk with him. And it'll be the power of God. It'll be the blood and his spirit uh, that we recognize has sanctified us. We'll take heed of the word of God. How to maintain a sanctified walk. Again, here's another kind of list someone's uh, put together. Some practical things we can do, we can think about how to maintain that walk with God. Actively obey the Holy Spirit through the word and conscience. So try to keep that sensitivity to what, what the Holy Spirit's prompting you. And obviously through his clear teachings, through his word. Discipline yourself to set apart time for prayer and study. If you fail, confess it immediately to God. He will restore you. And keep those, those close, short accounts with God. When you know you've slipped up, go to prayer and ask God to minister, to forgive you. Of course, we know we are forgiven uh, for all of our sin anyway at salvation. But there's that sense of that daily walk where we want to keep that fellowship right. We want to keep that intimacy right with our Lord. And so it's good to keep those things right with God. When we slip up, we can find his help. Resist the devil. Of course, submit to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. James 4, verse 7. Seek to be faithful in regular time of study, of prayer, of witness. Rely on the Lord. There's a scripture that says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. And don't look within. We can all get discouraged because we can all slip up and fail. Thank God it says that the righteous man, the just man falls seven times, but he keeps getting back up again. And so we can look up and be encouraged. Don't look within because we can look at ourselves and think, oh, I've failed again or I've slipped again. I've not been as holy as I should have been. But God will help you. We're not under condemnation. We should have conviction, but we're not under condemnation. That God will help us to get stronger and, and to keep walking righteously. And God will help us to overcome discouragement and to know his strength. And sometimes God might actually use chastening as well. Uh, that there might be times where if we're out of accord with God, if we're in a backslidden state, if we're in some sin, uh, God uses chastening, there's discipline. And he talks about that chastening is that we might be partakers of his holiness. So sometimes God will use chastening to help us get right. Of course, we're called to live the crucified life, to learn to crucify the flesh, the ungodly desires, the, the lusts, die to self, to die to the world. In Galatians 6.14, it says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So it's all by virtue of the cross that Christ died for our sins. He's given us salvation. and Sanctification is affected really, by the cross too. And we can uh, know that the world is crucified unto us. We can practically determined to die to self, to die to the world. Now just a quick recap, really. This one is just summing up, really, what we started with. How are we sanctified? It's by the word of God. The, the Lord Jesus prays, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. The word of God purifies and cleanses us. It makes us holy. So the more word that we get, the more we get fed and nourished and nurtured, and the more word we feed our hearts with, the more we'll be stronger. It's what we feed is what grows, isn't it? If we feed the flesh, the flesh will grow. But if we starve the flesh and rather feed the spirit, then our spirit will grow. So we feed the spirit with the word of God. Basically, feed your, feed your spirit with the word of God and starve the flesh, starve it to death. So the word of God purifies, it cleanses us. The, the blood of Christ affects our sanctification 
Sometimes there might be discipline, chastising. Yielding to God. It's that daily yielding to him. It's that daily surrender. And really, it's moment by moment surrender, isn't it? As we walk with God day by day, moment by moment, we ask God to show us his way and we'll be sensitive to his Holy Spirit to show us his way. It's interesting, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Holiness. The Spirit of Holiness. So he'll help us in that walk. He'll help affect holiness in our walk. And there's a sense where we exercise our will as well, that we cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. There's that sense where we exercise our will to determine what to, what to do, to seek out sin, to judge it, to cast it away, to pray for cleansing and strength to live a holy life. And so the doctrine of sanctification, it glorifies the Lord. It shows us that freedom from sinning has been obtained at Calvary. The power of sin has been broken. At the cross, the power of sin was broken. And so God just wants us to claim that freedom, to claim that righteousness that he grants to us by faith, to know that and to walk in that. So really the most important thing in the whole world is for the believer to know the will of God. And of course it says this is, this is God's will, your sanctification. God's will is that we live holy, that we live righteous. He says, be ye holy, even as I am holy. And so he'll help us to affect that, to have that holiness. It's not some impossible thing. It's not that we have to have some thought that it's impossible for us to, to know it. Because we realize it by faith at salvation. At salvation, we realize that we're made holy because Jesus has taken our sin. And we've realized his holiness. We've exchanged our sin for his holiness. So we have holiness in the present tense. But in the practical sense, sometimes we struggle. There's that battle that fight, that contest going on, that daily walk, that daily surrender that he wants us to have, to keep close to him, that sensitivity to his Holy Spirit. And then as we have that abounding more and more, that will grow in our faith, we'll grow in that walk with him, we'll grow in that walk of holiness, and then ultimately in glory we'll see his face and we'll know that full sinless perfection is really when we see his face. It's when we enter eternity that will be free from all the presence of sin. All, all of it will be gone. I trust that's helpful to, to get a picture of sanctification. It's a really big subject. As we say, mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible, sanctification and holiness. So hopefully we can think about how we have it at salvation, at the point of salvation, at conversion. We are, Christ is our sanctification. We have that walk with him that's an ongoing, it's our Christian growth, it's our spiritual growth, and then ultimately in glory we'll have the glorification, we'll be conformed to his image, we'll be fully freed from sin and the world and all of its ways. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you that your word tells us about these truths of holiness, of sanctification. Dear Lord, we know that it's your Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness that can work in our hearts and affect that gracious work that you call each one of us to, to know you as Saviour, as Lord. We pray if there's any yet to trust you, they'll simply say, Lord Jesus, thank you. You died for my sin to make me yours, to save me as I receive that gift of salvation. And Lord, even as we receive salvation, we have that forgiveness of our sins such that it's forgiven. Uh, it is no more. And we can walk in that in a practical way. Help us, Lord, in the practicalities of life to crucify the flesh, to die to self, to the world, to determine, Lord, to live that surrendered life uh, all to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.